introduction. So welcome to the third in our 16 webinar series, Contemporary Challenges in American and Global Law. I'm Leah Wortham, Professor America of Law at the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America. I'm the Catholic University Director of the American Law Program and the LLM Program in which Catholic, uh, Catholic University has cooperated with Jagiellonian University and Krakow Poland for many years. I will be your moderator. Louise Leiden, the Executive Director of Development and Alumni Relations for the Columbus School of Law at Catholic University of America will bring greetings from our law school. Thank you, Professor Wortham. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to applaud Professor Wortham's leadership from our end for pulling all of this program together, which she will say was a big team effort. And I really want to recognize her efforts to foster and cultivate the relationship with the best law school in Poland at Jagiellonian University. It's an honor to work with someone so knowledgeable about law, but also has a genuine, friendly people person personality. She is built on the deep roots established by the founder of our Catholic Jagiellonian relationship, Emeritus Professor Rhett Ludikowski, whom many of you know. Catholic law values this almost 30 year relationship and partnership with Jagiellonian University. The International Business and Trade Summer Law Program, American Law Program and LLM in Law now have more than 2000 US, Polish and other international alumni. And we welcome all of you here today. The panelists today are superb, and my hope is that through these Zoom meetings, we may grow our community, create even stronger ties with and among our alumni, and continue the dialogue on our shared global experience that the Catholic University and Jagiellonian programs have fostered. Thank you for being here with us today. We value your participation and look forward to seeing you more often. So stay well and, and don't be a stranger. Back to you, Professor. Great, thanks, Louise. I'll now uh, turn to Wojciech Banczyk who is the coordinator of the American Law School, and he will welcome you on behalf of Jagiellonian University. Thank you very much for uh, those nice, nice words, and uh, I'm very happy to see here all the participants of the series of webinars. Uh, organizers, uh, those who have done a, a really huge effort to make this series of webinars happen, as well as friends of the American, varied American law programs, held jointly by the Jagiellonian University and the Catholic University of America, as well as the participants, past participants, and hopefully future participants. It's a great pleasure for us that you all joined us in the online meeting, showing your interest in contemporary challenges in American and global law, as well as varied initiatives coordinated by the Catholic Amer University of America and Jagiellonian University. Many of such initiatives have been developed throughout its cooperation for years and actually longer than the lifetime of quite many participants. Given the current difficulties, the traditional way in which the joint programs used to be held uh, is no longer possible. We decided to develop a new initiative so that in the absence of traditional inside meetings that we appreciate so much, we could offer at least a new way to learn and to meet together, sometimes being uh, the possibility that normally we do not have. At the same time, we do hope that sooner or later we will meet in person during our programs or alumni events. Many thanks. So we're delighted to see so many of you. I see now 124 people. I've been scrolling through the names and happy to see several of our LLM graduates, former students. I see at least Professors Ludwikowski, to which we owe much of that we're here at all, Professor Kelly, Professor Duggan, Professor Pelt Steele, uh, and I'm probably even more people that I will see shortly. I want to remind you that the remaining three webinars before Christmas are all on exciting law and technology topics. Those are November 24th, December 2nd, and December 9th. Those are on the cloud, data privacy, and artificial intelligence. Um, so I encourage uh, both Catholic and Yaglonian have very strong programs in intellectual property and communications and law and technology. So I encourage you to think of classmates, friends, and colleagues who might be interested. This webinar is a time a team effort, starting with the support of Dean Stephen Payne here at Catholic and Dean Yezhi Pisulinski, Dean of the Faculty of Law Administration at Yaglonian University. The webinars reflect the hard work and leadership 
of the staff of the Yagalonian Center for Foreign Law School Cooperation, commonly known as OXPO, and the Catholic University, Central University, and our law school's development and alumni relations offices. We also rely on our LLM coordinators and LLM graduates, Gaspar Cote and Luke Bartosik, who are available for any questions about our LLM program. So now we turn to today's webinar by Catholic University Professor Roger Cullenbow on nonprofits in crisis, changes to giving rules and politicization with comments by Dr. Katarzyna Zdimska Szymanowska. I expect most of you have used Zoom before or a similar video conference platform. I've already mentioned information placed in the chat. You should see a chat button in the tray on the bottom of your screen or depending on your device, it might be on the top or the side. When you click on the chat, you will see things that others have typed. And there's a bubble at the bottom where you can type in questions that you would like directed to the speakers. In the Zoom version we're using today, you should also see a participants button. When you click on that, you can see the names of others who are signed on. If you go to the gallery view button on this top of your screen, uh, for most of you, you can see the screens of those who are signed on. If you see a classmate to whom you would like to send a message, you should have an option to do so with a private chat by hitting the drop down and switching from everyone to that person's name. Unfortunately, the registration software we use does not speak Polish and it does not recognize some Polish characters. So we apologize for anyone's name that ends up with a question mark. Uh, when you register in the future, it just use English characters to avoid that problem. Professor Kalanvo will speak for about 20 minutes. He'll be followed by a short comment by uh, Dr. Szybiswowska, who will also lead off the question and answer period. As I mentioned, type your questions in the chat, and then I will pose the questions to our speakers. The session is being recorded, and the 60-minute webinar, the first 60 minutes, will be posted on CUA's YouTube channel within a few days, and the series website has links to those recordings. At the end of 60 minutes, the formal webinar will close and we'll stop the recording, but Professor Kalando and Dr. Szybiswowska graciously have agreed to stay on for up to another half an hour so we can take more of your questions. So I encourage all of those of you who have the time to stay on for that additional half hour. So in the chat, you will now see a link to a bio for Professor Kalando and links to the Helena Nietzsche Legal Aid Center of which Dr. Szybiswowska is president and was a founder. And I will mention just a few highlights of their biographies. Professor Colin Bow is a full professor of law at Catholic University, as well as director of the CUA Law and Public Policy Program. Prior to joining the CUA faculty, he was counsel at the nonpartisan Joint Committee on Taxation in the US Congress with responsibility for nonprofit tax legislation. He has testified about nonprofit tax reform before committees in both chambers of the US Congress, advised the White House and Treasury Department, and served as an advisor to the Urban Institute, the National Center on Philanthropy, and the Law, uh, and the law at New York University, and the Independent Sector, which is a coalition of nonprofits, foundations, and corporate giving programs. Just this fall, Professor Colin Bell was asked by the Washington Post to review videos of conservative groups discussing election tactics and publicizing conspiracy theories to provide an opinion as a tax expert regarding whether such activities raised a question about support for political candidates in violation of their tax exempt status. And that was a front page story on the Washington Post. Professor Colin Vo received his JD magna cum laude from Indiana University Law School and an M lit from Merton College at Oxford University. He clerked for the Honorable Theodore Bohm of the Indiana Supreme Court. I've known Dr. Upshibaswowska since her days as a student at Yagalonian, which she, when she was then Kasia Zibska, which is an easier name to pronounce for Americans. As many of you on this call know, uh, Yagalonian was a pioneer in clinical education, having established the first successful clinical program in Central Europe that has continually operated since 1997. CUA professor Catherine Klein and I were privileged to work with the Yagalonian Clinic founders who included professor and former vice dean Maria Szewczyk, professor and now Polish Supreme Court judge Wojciech Wrubel, 
professor and now Dean Yezhi Pisulinski, Professor Frederick Soul, and Dr. Helena Nietzsche. Those of you who are fortunate to know Dr. Nietzsche know that she founded a human rights center at Yagalonian in 1993 and was an inspirational figure dedicated to the rights of vulnerable people, including refugees and migrants, and to the education of Yagalonian students in human rights. Dr. Shibaswaska visited CUA in 2001 as a student assistant in the Human Rights Clinic, and she was a student in the 2002-2003 American Law Program, including a star student in my class. After Dr. Nietzsche's untimely death in 2002, former students, including Dr. Shibaswaska, founded the Helena Nietzsche Legal Aid Center to carry on her work, and the URLs in the chat give you links to the center's work. Dr. Shibaswaska received her Magister from Yagalonian in 2003 and her PhD in 2007 with a thesis focused on exclusion clauses in the 1951 Refugee Convention and on disfavored refugees. She was a visiting fellow at the Oxford University Refugee Studies Center in 2005 and is the author of a 2009 book published by the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. She leads the Helena Nietzsche Legal Aid Center, a Krakow-based NGO dedicated to providing free legal aid to refugees and stateless people in Poland. We now turn to Professor Kalenbo. Remember to type your questions in the chat and his remarks will be followed by Dr. Shibaswaska for a comment and the lead off with questions. Well, terrific. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Wortham, for the introduction and for organizing this panel and for inviting me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, and I extend greetings to what looks like most of you who are overseas and, and maybe about to have dinner after this. I'm not sure. But um, so. My talk, the headline of my talk is Nonprofits in Crisis. And I'm a little reluctant to use the word crisis because it, it's, it's almost overused these days, as I think all of us are, are feeling crises of varying degrees. Certainly in my lifetime, I've never felt quite the same level of political strife or, or civic stress. And it, it feels as if many things are in crisis. So when I say nonprofits are in crisis, um, I'm not using it as hyperbole. I really think they are at the edge of crisis. Um, and it's just yet another challenge uh, that we're facing, at least here in this country. So um, now that there's the immediate crisis that nonprofits face, which is really the result of the pandemic. Um, so the, the pandemic has placed our nonprofit organizations under incredible stress. So they are responsible and on the front lines uh, to serving people's needs. Uh, we rely on nonprofits for food insecurity, for providing shelter, for health care, for education, for religion, and now also for social justice issues, which have um, taken uh, very much the front pages uh, as well in this country. So nonprofits are facing increasing demands on their services and at the same time they are really crunched uh, financially so uh, it's very difficult to raise money in this climate um, many of their services have been shut down making it harder to raise money from programs they perform uh, and of course the fact of a pandemic makes it very difficult to generate community spirit um, and bring people and neighborhoods together because getting close together is uh, now actually a safety and a public health risk. So nonprofits really are under stress. Um, and for many nonprofits, this is an ex existential crisis and they will not come out of, of the pandemic. But um, that said, uh, the pandemic, I hope, will be a short-term crisis and we will emerge from it um, sometime soon. And when we do, nonprofits are actually going to be facing much more of a longer term structural crisis in this country that has been many years in the making. And so that's what I wanna spend uh, my talk uh, discussing. And here I wanna hit three main areas. So uh, the first one is the state of the charitable giving incentives in the United States. The basic problem here is that too few donors now get the charitable deduction or the charitable giving incentive. 
And in my view, this is going to undermine uh, the legitimacy of charitable giving policy, as well as perhaps the broader charitable sector itself. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is the increasing use of financial intermediaries for charitable giving. And here I have in mind something called donor advised funds. Uh, and the, the, as these funds are being used more and more by wealthy givers, um, I'm concerned that it's leading to a change in the way we give and in the culture of giving. Um, and I have some ideas about how to address that issue. And then finally, I want to talk about um, a, a manufactured crisis that arose in this country several years ago coming out of the Supreme Court's decision in the case Citizens United, uh, which has led to um, nonprofits essentially being used uh, to facilitate so-called dark money or anonymous political speech. And this in turn has led to a crisis of oversight by the IRS, the agency charged with um, enforcing the laws. And that is also um, feeding into uh, real difficulties in the nonprofit world here in the US. So I'll try and give a thumbnail of, of, of all three of those issues and then um, look forward to your comments and questions. So the first issue is the state of the charitable giving incentives. And I think as most of you know, and I, I know you're, you're not experts in, in uh, federal income tax law here in the US, but most of you probably know or have some idea that there is something called a charitable deduction. And what that means is that if somebody gives to charity, they get a, a tax benefit. Uh, and here the charity is called a 501c3 organization. So this charitable deduction uh, has been in the tax code since 1917, and it's what we also call an itemized deduction. And basically an itemized deduction means that it's only taken by the wealthiest of taxpayers. And that has always been the case. Uh, that's just the way itemized deductions work. Um, but a change in the law in 2017 has dramatically shrunk the number of itemizers. Uh, and so after the 2017 changes, effectively 21 million people lost the ability to claim the charitable deduction. Uh, now this means, if you think about it another way, that we went from a, a system where about a quarter to a third of the taxpaying population had some incentive to make gifts to a system where just 10 to 12% of taxpayers now have an incentive to make gifts. So overnight, we've essentially cut what I call the participation rate for the charitable deduction from about 30% of the population down to 10%, uh, which means that now we're in a situation where only the wealthiest 10% of taxpayers will have an incentive to make charitable gifts. Um, now I, I state that in a kind of a dry way, but th this is a huge change to the law. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's highly significant um, and, it, and it was unintended in that uh, when Congress passed the law, this was done as a simplification measure, but there was no intent to have an adverse impact on the charitable sector or on nonprofits writ large. So let me talk about what some of the effects might be of shrinking the base of participation for the charitable deduction. So the first one is, is maybe the obvious one, which is that we would expect that with fewer donors, there will be fewer dollars, right? So there's gonna be less money raised to go to charity. And um, some estimates have put the amount at about $17 billion a year that is, that is less in money raised for charity. So that's significant and that's important, um, but I think it, it misses the bigger picture to focus exclusively on the total amount of money that is raised because the charitable deduction is not just about raising money for charity. Uh, at bottom, what the charitable deduction is for is to encourage giving. It's, it's to encourage the act of giving. 
Uh, what we would like to see is members uh, of society engaging in the, the altruistic act of giving something up, of making a sacrifice, um, of, of participating uh, civically, getting involved in their communities, and giving something away. This is what the charitable deduction is designed to do, uh, and it is uh, a very, very strange signal for federal tax policy to say that the only giving that is worth subsidizing is the giving by the wealthiest 10% of Americans. Um, and this is, in my view, a terrible signal to be sending. Um, but it's not just that it's a bad signal that we're only going to reward the giving of the wealthiest, but it also leads to serious changes in the charitable sector itself. Because when you reflect, as I have over many years, on, on what the purpose, the fundamental purpose of the charitable deduction is, it's, it's to build civil society. Um, and it's to do so through pluralism and by strengthening our civic institutions and making them more dynamic. And the way that happens in large part is by having a broad base of participants. So when you have a charitable deduction where roughly a third of the population can participate, what you're doing is you are funding the choices of a significant slice of the, of the population. And those choices then are manifest in the types of organizations that get funded. If we shrink the participation base of the deduction down to the top 10%, what we're really doing is we're now only funding the charitable choices of the wealthiest of the population which is eventually going to affect the makeup of the charitable sector so that it in turn is going to reflect this giving class. Um, so I think this ultimately is going to call into question the very legitimacy of the charitable deduction is it can no longer plausibly be claimed to be a true giving incentive that promotes choice and fosters pluralism. Um, and in addition, uh, as taxpayers start to learn that they no longer get a tax benefit for their charitable gifts, it's natural to believe that the market for giving will change as well. Because the 90% of the population that no longer gets a tax break for their gifts, it's not as if they're going to stop giving all of a sudden. They'll still give because we give for a whole variety of reasons. But once they know they no longer have to give to a 501c3 public benefit organization, they will direct their dollars to other groups. And many of these other groups are going to serve more private interests. So we'll see the rise of crowdfunding as we've already seen. We'll see the rise of more groups that are focused on serving private causes and less public ones. Um, and I also expect that we will see more and more gifts generated to political groups because political groups will form for quasi charitable purposes and essentially attempt to attract dollars that otherwise would go to 501c3 organizations, but no longer will. So I think overall by shrinking the base of participants in the charitable um, giving incentive uh, we've now got a status quo that is unsustainable. Um, so I have been working with others to advance legislation that would expand the charitable giving incentive and make it more widely available to all taxpayers. There are a number of different ways we could do this. Um, and I'm hopeful that this can be done on a bipartisan basis, um, maybe in the, in the, the next administration. Um, so that's the first issue I wanted to talk about. The next one is related uh, because as we think about the top 10% as the only ones getting the charitable deduction, um, we're, we're also getting more interested in the way the top 10% are giving away their money. So if I asked you what you thought um, the most successful charity was last year in terms of raising money, what would you say? Well, I can't really hear all of your answers, but my guess is that uh, the first word out of your mouth would not be the word fidelity. Um, so fidelity uh, might make you think of trust or fiduciary duties. In this country, if you think about fidelity, you think about um, the large commercial uh, investment firm. So fidelity is a, a financial firm that essentially uh, allows individuals to buy mutual funds, uh, retirement accounts, annuities, 
and make investments for their future. That's what Fidelity does. Well, Fidelity, many years ago, set up an affiliated charity called Fidelity Charitable. And believe it or not, Fidelity Charitable it now raises more charitable funds than any other charity in the United States. In fact, they raise twice as much money as the United Way, which most people think of as one of the biggest fundraisers, and it still is. Now, Fidelity is one of a number of donor advised sponsors, and guess who the other two big ones are? Schwab Charitable and Vanguard Charitable who are also investment firms that have set up affiliated charities. Um, and if, if you look at some of the data, the, the top four donor advised fund sponsoring organizations have raised more money in a year than the top 10 regular charities combined. So what that means is that these financial donor advised sponsors are raising an increasing share of all charitable gifts. So next you might ask me, gosh, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that, that there was this, this, uh, this commercial sort of affiliation in the charitable giving world. So what are they doing? What is a donor advised fund? Well, the idea is that um, you make a, a contribution to Fidelity Charitable and Fidelity Charitable then sets up an account in your name. And it's kind of like a charitable savings account. So you get all of the tax benefits when you make the contribution to Fidelity Charitable, um, but you retain the ability to advise at some future date where that money will go. So um, you can give the money today to, to Fidelity and then advise years later that the money goes out to the Red Cross or the Cancer Society or something like that. Um, so these donor advised funds, um, are very popular uh, and, and they sound pretty good and, and really what's not to like, right? I mean, um, don donors love them. They get a income tax deduction when they make the contribution. They get to take money out of their estate for estate tax purposes so it won't be taxed if they die. Um, they also get a capital gains exclusion if they're giving property that has appreciated in value over the years um, and they are under no requirement ever to pay the money out. That is, the money goes in, but it never has to come out. And right now, donor advised funds hold over $120 billion, um, which is not subject to any sort of payout requirement whatsoever. Um, and so to me, this is really um, the issue what, uh, for, for donor advised funds, which is that the money um, even though the tax benefits have been given up, the money can sit there forever. Uh, and in fact, if anything, the incentives uh, are against paying the money out of the DAF. And that's because much of this money is managed by financial firms like Fidelity, Schwab, and Vanguard. And uh, they make money by having more money under management. So they have no institutional incentive to nudge donors to get money out the door. And donors in turn are under subtle incentives to accumulate the money. Um, and you can think of this as if there's some sort of a charitable wealth effect, namely that once a donor has funded their DAF and it gets larger and larger, it looks like they are wealthier and wealthier from a charitable perspective. And this charitable wealth then can be passed down to their heirs who also can have the same advisory privileges um, and, and bestow their, their charitable munificence in the future. Um, so there are subtle disincentives to pay out. Uh, and, and this to me raises a serious question, which is whether we ought to change the rules to require some sort of incentive or payout from donor advised funds. Uh, part of the problem is, is that the giving incentives just were not set up with this type of a giving vehicle in mind. The, the point of the giving incentives is not just to give something to charity, but it is to make an outright gift to charity. The problem with DAFs is that even though donors have given up legal control of the funds, they have retained effective control um, of those funds. And I'm concerned that as DAFs become more and more of the norm, donors increasingly will shift away from the historic model of outright giving 
and toward a more grant making and philanthropist model. And I think what this could mean down the road is that the, the charitable giving that we subsidize is no longer a subsidy for outright giving, but it's just a subsidy to encourage the earmarking of funds for the eventual charitable use. Um, and I think we can and should do um, a lot better than that. Um, so that's two issues. The third issue uh, I want to get into is, is not really related to the giving side, but it's related more to the oversight side um, of how are the charitable organizations and nonprofits um, in, in the United States are overseen by the IRS. So, so the, the story here really goes back to a Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, back in 2013. And I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with that this case. It's certainly a well-known case here. But without getting deeply into the details, under the Citizens United decision, the Supreme Court held uh, for the first time that corporations, including nonprofit corporations, uh, are allowed to engage in unlimited independent political speech. So this means that a, a corporation can be set up and just engage in electoral activity, not subject to any limit, so long as it's not coordinated with any political campaign. Okay, so far so good, except um, this really opens up a, a hornet's nest for nonprofits. And the reason is that most or many political operatives that want to engage in electoral speech typically choose as their form, something we call over here the PAC or the Political Action Committee. Uh, and these PACs are organized under a special section of the tax code called Section 527, which um, it works for political organizations. The trouble with organizing these new, now called super PACs um, after Citizens United is if they were organized as political organizations, then their donors were subject to campaign finance disclosure rules. So political operatives kind of looked around at the corporate landscape and saw that if they instead organized their political corporate speech through the nonprofit form, namely through a 501c4 or social welfare organization, then um, they could speak but we're not subject to uh, disclosure rules. And this is where the dark money idea comes from. Namely that if I set up my political speech through a nonprofit 501c4 vehicle, I now avoid campaign disclosure rules and can engage in dark or anonymous speech. The problem is, and maybe the only problem is that if you set up political speech through a nonprofit vehicle, there's a tax rule that limits the amount of political speech you're allowed to engage in. Um, and so uh, this essentially led to groups forming under the nonprofit form, but having to come up with kind of a phony nonprofit purpose as a way of supporting their political speech. So that's a lot of background to get to what I call the manufactured scandal. Um, and the scandal is that the IRS found itself suddenly confronted with a flood of grassroots organizations that were applying for tax exempt status under C4 with the name like with the names of different tea party organizations in their title. So if you are a, an organization applying for tax exemption and you were to come before the IRS and say I'm a political party, the IRS would look at you and say you're a political organization, you should go over here. Um, but these groups, um, many of them weren't political parties, they were um, true nonprofits, but ultimately the IRS dithered and wasn't sure what to do or how to classify these groups. And their, their dithering um, and delay ultimately led to an enormous outcry and accusations that the IRS specifically targeted these groups and delayed and denied their tax exemptions solely on the basis of their political views and alignment with conservative causes. Um, the trouble then became that in the aftermath of this outcry, 
um, the Congress essentially defunded the IRS, taking money away from the IRS, the entire agency, and also from the specific part of the IRS that has to oversee nonprofits. Um, so as a result, what we have now is the IRS in a total defensive crouch without any money and effectively unwilling um, to enforce the law. And so what we're seeing is a gradual erosion of standards in the nonprofit world. Um, and this is opening the door for groups uh, to come in uh, that are more um, propaganda in nature than charitable uh, and exploit an effective uh, lack of oversight by the IRS, which is further diluting the standards of charity um, and making it worse for all nonprofits. And there are a lot of other pressures here too, because um, there are many here who would like to relax the rules that prohibit charities from getting involved in any type of political activity. Um, and that is increasing um, pressure on, on nonprofits to actually engage in political activity because there's been a, a sign by this administration that the law won't be enforced. And so it's becoming more and more like the Wild West. Anyway, so there are these three areas, uh, the charitable giving incentives, the rise of um, giving intermediaries and uh, the weaknesses of enforcement that are all combining, I think, to create a state of crisis uh, for nonprofits in the United States. I try to remain optimistic. I think some of these problems are fixable. Um, they require political will. Uh, they require clear thinking, but uh, certainly they, it, it can be done. And I'm, I'm hopeful that, that um, in the next administration, we can um, uh, find ways to address some of these solutions. So I'll stop there uh, and, and, and hand it off um, to you, Kasha. Thanks so much, Roger. And we'll now turn to Kasha. I think one of the things that um, probably many of our listeners from Poland, as you listen to what you're talking about, there are so many ways in which our premises in the United States about what uh, the relationship of the government is to the nonprofit sector, how we deal with it, uh, how we fund political activity, I think you'll start to see so many differences. And that's one of the things we really appreciate about the American Law Program is to help you not only know specific things about law, but really start to understand how, even though our societies are so similar, in many ways, we take very different approaches in terms of the relationship of the public sector, the private sector, and so on. So uh, we'll now turn to Kasha. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, first of all, to the host and organizers of the meeting to giving me the opportunity to participate and uh, mention a couple of points about the Polish situation, the Polish context. Uh, as you have introduced me already, I have been working in the NGO sector for over 18 years now. Um, so my experience when it comes to, uh, to money, basically money in civil society organizations is really hands-on. So this is not my field of specialty, but I do have, uh, I believe, experience in um, seeing the different links and different consequences of how the use of money, the use of tax deductions as well, um, influences the work and the situation of uh, non-government organizations. Uh, one word uh, that is very familiar, kind of sounds very familiar when it comes to the situation of civil society organizations that Professor Colimbo has mentioned in the beginning is the word crisis. Um, I hate the word as well. I think it's been overused in many contexts and it has gained, um, I would say, um, a flavor that is not perhaps the best that is describing uh, many um, um, very complex phenomena. However, uh, it is true that organizations in Poland have been going through a crisis, although this is a very diff different crisis from uh, the situation uh, that is in the US, uh, because it's mostly a political crisis that is uh, linked to the situation, um, especially in the central European countries. Uh, but first, uh, I wanted to make a couple of very basic points. Uh, my first point is that money is power. It's very clear, but whenever we are talking about money, we really are talking about power and we are talking about um, the control that the money uh, is giving. Um, 
The second point is that organizations that are seen as charitable organizations, uh, organizations that are working in the field of human rights are always seen as political. And especially in countries where the governing party, where the ruling party um, has um, a very, I would say, restrictive view on what the human rights should be or has a very specific view of how the human rights should be um, um, defined. Uh, the work of non-government organizations is always, always seen as political. Um, so here we are talking about you know, organizations that are not really working as political entities, but are often seen as working in the political climate. And whenever the question of money is uh, discussed, it always becomes, um, as a consequence, a political matter. So um, when you uh, create and establish laws, legal framework for how to manage the tax deductions, uh, charitable deductions, uh, how to manage the flow of money that goes into the civil society sector, it's always a wider debate of who you want to support and who you don't want to support um, as a result. Um, so um, the, the third point and, and kind of the, I would say the most important when it comes to the work of NGOs, especially in, nowadays um, in Europe and in Central Europe uh, specifically, uh, is the question of independence. So if the money gives control, um, it's very difficult uh, to uh, still become an independent NGO when you still need the money to, to finance, to forward the causes that you're working, working on. And the only kind of solution to this is to di diversify the source of funding. Um, in Polish tax law, there are luckily two ways of, um, of applying the detection of taxes uh, for charitable donations, and it's very inclusive. So it's not uh, linked to the level of income as in the US has become a, a problem. Uh, and simply everyone who is paying taxes uh, can use this deduction. It's up to 6% of income. And the second way uh, is you can uh, devote 1% of the tax that you are paying to a selected um, organization that has the status of a civil society organization. So these are the two ways of, of using. So you would think that actually we are in a much better position than many of the charitable organizations in the US because um, anyone can be a donor and anyone can be uh, using these special instruments to actually support the cause uh, that they wish to do. But in reality, uh, I think, and I think that this is my basic problem with, with these deductions. It does not really actually promote the act of giving as much as we would assume it would. So the level of individual donorship in Poland um, has for years traditionally has been very, very low. And um, only a small number of people actually, uh, I would say really, <laughs> put a thought into the decision of choosing the charitable cause that they would like to support. And a part of these two instruments, the, the level of support is extremely low. So this leaves the organizations uh, still competing for money uh, that is uh, available elsewhere. So competing for money that is uh, given through, for example, EU um, funds, EU calls for projects and uh, to ask for money to international donors or uh, foreign um, foundations. And this has become a risk in the recent years as well. And one of the, I think, interesting examples uh, that I would like to share with you is the Hungarian example. I've seen, I've, I thought I've seen some Hungarian names of participants. So maybe we'll have more questions or more insights about this um, later on. But uh, what Hungary did, and this was seen as a kind of great example to follow by the Polish government as well. In 2017, they have passed uh, a law, a very um, specific law that is targeting the uh, NGO money. Uh, and it pretty much says that any uh, non-governmental organization working in Hungary that is receiving uh, money from any entities that are not Hungarian entities, so any foundations, any donors that are foreign, 
should register this uh, specifically and should publish this um, on a special list that is run by, by the state, by the government. At the same time, if you have been visiting Hungary uh, around 2017, 2018, uh, the government has spent lots and lots of money on a huge campaign saying that uh, George Soros is pretty much the enemy of the state and that he is trying to meddle uh, in political, uh, in the internal politics of the state. And he, you know, he was everywhere on giant billboards um, all over the country. So what the effect of this was is actually um, trying to um, convince the public in Hungary that NGOs that are using the money that comes from Soros and other donors that are seen as foreign donors, they're actually trying to, um, to disrupt the political situation in Hungary and they're trying to use this money uh, against the interest of the Hungarian state. Uh, this law has been sued and in uh, June 2020, this year, the ECJ, so the European Court of Justice, has decided that uh, these regulations are illegal, that they violate the European uh, standards, the European laws. So uh, the end result is, let's say, positive, but um, the, the, the years, the three years when this law has been in force has already had consequences in uh, simply the general public in, in, um, in Hungary losing trust um, and simply making look the NGOs as um, not being credible, not being transparent with their money because they're using, they're reportedly using money that comes from other sources um, to forward um, uh, different ideas that are not really serving uh, the Hungarian state. Um, so, uh, so I think th that's for the comment. <laughs> I can go into details a little bit more if there are more questions. But my first question, maybe we can start with with question from from myself. I understand that I'm allowed to ask the first <laughs> question right. to the speaker. Uh, so my first question to Professor Konvo is: Do you don't you think that actually the mechanism of the uh, tax deduction of the charitable donation? is not really serving its original purpose. Because you said yourself that the original purpose of this whole mechanism is to actually promote the act of giving. And in Poland, what we have seen is actually that it's not promoting the act of giving because many people um, are just using the 1% deduction. You know, in some cases they're using it, in other cases they're not using it, but they're not really becoming donors um, in the real sense of the word. They're not really actually paying anything because they believe that this has kind of consumed, um, you know, the, 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 the donorship they were kind of expected to do. And um, most NGOs uh, in Poland cannot rely on private donations because there's simply not enough um, of these private donations um, um, for the money to, to kind of support the different causes. So don't you think that it's kind of defeating the purpose of, of giving? I know it's a bit provocative, but there you go. Well, no, I, I mean, I, I think um, here there, are, there are arguments about what the charitable deduction really is for. So there, there, I don't think there's universal agreement about that, but um, I think that it has been successful in promoting giving. And, and that's, that's pretty clear just um, if you look at the culture of giving in this country. So um, every year around Christmas time, um, there are pledges that go out from charitable organizations and people regularly give uh, annually, we've got coming up on December the 1st, Giving Tuesday, uh, which is organized by charities to try and get people to give. Um, most charitable organizations have a fundraising campaign that is really structured around the charitable deduction. So there's the, the whole idea that we, we have this, um, a, this opportunity to raise money that is tied to a tax benefit. Um, and if you look at any charitable solicitation, it almost always says, you know, as deductible by law. And, and this, this, this tax benefit has really become a part of our culture. Um, and I think it, it has created this sense that we do give as individuals 
Uh, it's a widespread phenomenon. And in fact, if you look at giving rates, it's pretty extraordinary the percentage of Americans that actually do give to charity. And when you look at the total numbers that we raise, it's astronomical. I mean, there's over $300 billion a year are collected and donated to charities. So there actually is a culture of giving in this country. I wouldn't want to credit the charitable deduction um, as the reason for that culture, but it definitely has helped to support it. And so for me, the real question is, and, and, it's, and it's a real tension that I have in my own thinking, um, which is once, once we shrink the base of the deduction so that it has so few participants, I think that does create the problems um, I suggested, which kind of leads me to a fork in the road. I think one question, one question is whether we should just get rid of the deduction altogether. Um, that is, it, it doesn't seem sustainable to me as a status quo to have a deduction for just the richest 10%. Um, so that says either we should get rid of that model and just rely on people to give for goodwill and altruistic reasons and have no tax benefit, or we need to extend the deduction to everybody. And at the end of the day, I come, uh, I come down on extending the deduction because I think that's where we are culturally. We are so used to having this tax incentive and it really has helped support our private charities that I think I'm not ready to be done with it yet. Thank you. I'm looking at the questions in the chat. We have about um, seven, eight minutes that we'll do before we shut down the recording. And then again, we'll have another 30 minutes. Uh, we had a question from uh, Arthur Yagiello, which was actually, I think, very much overlapping Kasha's question and that Roger has just addressed, was whether the charitable deduction actually undermines the main purpose of charities, aren't charities, supposed to be that people give selflessly. So why do we encourage people to engage in activities by giving them financial benefits? Should we take a different approach, one that would be associated less with financial and economic advantages, which I think is part of what Roger was addressing. I'm gonna um, shift it a bit. We have a couple of more specific questions about things about how the system works, uh, but for the remainder for this point, I wanna stick with this broader question because I think you've both alluded to the relationship of the of charitable giving to supporting civil society. Uh, and of course, in listening to you, uh, you're talking about a lot of intended and unintended consequences. This is all about why we ought to all really care about the tax code, <laughs> even though many people say, I'm not a tax lawyer. Uh, and uh, Kasha has made the, the really interesting point that with less of a, of a um, culture of individual giving, in Poland that, that NGOs have to be reliant on larger foundations and governmental giving. And of course, there's a different tradition about private philanthropy versus what the government is. It's a very big difference in the US and Europe. So I wanted to just um, sort of a, a very broad question, but the notion of how you think the country's approaches reflect attitudes to civil society. This is something that Roger alluded to. So let me start with Roger and then also I'd love to hear from Kasha as well. Um, well, so that's, that's a tricky one to answer because I think some of the, the attitudes to civil society in this country are, are based not, not on tax incentives, right? But are just based on corporate law and the ability to associate in the, in the First Amendment where, where we strongly and firmly believe that we have a right to associate, we have a right to form private groups, it's easy to organize, it's easy to be recognized as a legitimate group. Um, and I think where, where the charitable laws have helped there is that um, we grant tax exempt status to groups um, that are charitable and charity is defined incredibly broadly, right? And, and that's really, that is important to civil society and to, and to defining a broad charitable sector. You don't have to produce any sort of tangible benefit or any tangible good, as long as you further some um, traditional concept of charitable or educational purpose, you qualify, you get the supports of tax exemption, you get the additional support of deductible contributions, um, and so I think it's a combination of the freedom of association, the ease of incorporation, the tax benefits, 
all then help to establish a dynamic and pluralistic civil society. And the tax benefits are just one piece of that, but they're an important piece. Um, one, one thing I wanna quickly point out, cause it's, it's important in thinking about the role of government and the role of private philanthropy is that many times um, people think of the charitable deduction and overstate its importance to our civil society because um, it, when it comes down to it, it's really responsible only for funding. It's around 12% of, of total funds for charities. The biggest funder of charitable organizations is the government in this country. Um, and so the money comes from the government through um, a, a lot of different sources. And, and then the role of the private charitable deduction really then becomes a role of facilitating private choices in terms of how these groups form and which groups are able to attract private money. So it kind of also, um, it does resemble a, a, a public-private partnership uh, as well. But. Tasha? Um, yeah, I think the 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 Polish the Polish example is um, is, is is so different. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. I mean, um, for the past for the past few years, the situation in Poland for NGOs has been very very difficult, uh, financially especially. So. Um, I would say that for any democratic countries, uh, the more um, civil society organizations and just civil society entities um, exist, uh, the better, because we see, um, you know, we, we see a more pluralistic um, society uh, and we can promote the, the culture of civil society, the culture of giving as well, the culture of NGOs. And I think this is for me, for example, this is the biggest challenge and the biggest goal to actually promote um, the culture of doing something uh, as a volunteer to associate with people who, who believe in the same ideals and to also promote um, giving as just becoming a, you know, just becoming a good, a good person. I think this is, um, this is a very simple cause. But uh, because of the political tensions uh, in Poland, many NGOs that um, are somehow related to, uh, to human rights that are seen as political, as I mentioned in my little comment, um, they have, um, you know, they have had to struggle with a lot of pressure from, um, from governmental institutions and also they have seen um, um, a more difficult access uh, to any funding that is somehow influenced by uh, the government. And we actually have seen uh, a lot of NGOs uh, just um, either scaling down their, um, their operations or activities because they, they started losing money or just um, just closing down um, uh, because they, they simply could not support um, the actions that, that they were um, they were doing um, because of this lack of funding. Um, so 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 definitely uh, you know <laughs> we are going through through a lot of a um, lot of different obstacles and uh, and this is a very sad um, experience because I think. Um, for me, uh, civil society organizations uh, are really trying, you know, they're trying to represent the, the society. So we are representing different sections of the society. We don't have to necessarily agree on everything. For example, my NGO is working with refugees, is working with asylum seekers, providing free legal aid to asylum seekers in Poland, which, which is not a hugely popular cause, uh, especially these days. Um, so, uh, not all NGOs have to be, you know, in agreement uh, on uh, certain values or causes, but we need the, uh, the, the, the government to allow all of these organizations to actually carry out their missions if they are not against the laws of the state, they're not against the constitution, the, the civil uh, rights that are enshrined in the, in the constitution, because this is uh, just a way of allowing the civil society to grow and the people to express um, their ideals. So, um, so we don't really uh, experience difficulties in terms of the uh, tax laws and how they are applied because they are applied in a very, I would say, liberal manner and they are very inclusive and in allowing everyone to, to use the deductions. But we are experiencing completely different um, uh, sort of tensions and uh, this uh, losing of trust and uh, this kind of creation of tensions and conflict has become very detrimental. 
that was that's fascinating. And again, I think it draws this issue draws so many interesting questions about differences in, in our society approach and where we both find ourselves. We have reached the 60 minute mark. I'm going to formally, we're gonna turn off the recording and uh, close the part that will be recorded. We encourage all of you 